Baseball season is now in full swing, so I have a simple test for any, those of you who know anything about baseball. I want you to define a fair ball without using any references to the foul lines. That's not an easy task. Perhaps you would say a fair ball is one that lands well in the general area of the pitcher or the fielders and is in play. Or maybe you'd say a fair ball is one that is alive where the runners can advance and the opponents try to put you out. There are many kinds of fair balls. There's a grounder toward shortstop. There can be a line drive over third base. There can be a long hit to right field. Even a home run is a fair ball or a bunt down the first baseline. They're all fair balls, but how do you define it? The simplest definition is to use the foul lines. Anything that falls within the foul lines is a fair ball. That's the simplest description. I want to use that kind of analogy today in talking about the topic of the Trinity. The Trinity is the subject of the day as this is Trinity Sunday. But it's a very difficult concept to define. In fact, it is a mind-blowing concept when you really think about it. John Wesley once said this, Show me a worm that can comprehend a human being, and I will show you a human being that can comprehend the Trinity. Then, uh, who was it? Luther said, To try to comprehend the Trinity endangers your sanity. Well, it's just that difficult to fully understand how we can talk about three persons and one God. I want to try to do it today by defining what is out of, bound, out of bounds like we do with baseball. What are the concepts of God that would not fall in the right definition of the Trinity? Which ones are extreme on one side and which would be extreme on the other? But first of all, I want to give you a classic understanding or definition of the doctrine of the Trinity, which is traditionally given to Tertullian, who lived 145 to 220. He coined the term, and this is what the Trinity means in classic Christian doctrine. Maybe you will understand this just fine. God is one being who exists simultaneously and eternally at a mutual indwelling of three persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. They are three persons in one God, all three of whom, as distinct and co-eternal persons, are one indivisible divine essence, a simple being. If you understood that completely, then you don't have a problem with the Trinity, and you don't have to listen to this sermon. But for most of us, we look at that and we say, say, what? So rather than trying to explain what it is, I want to look at these boundary lines and see if we can understand them and say the Trinity is sort of where the fair ball falls, but what are those foul lines that we could say that's outside the line of what we would call the Trinity? First, I want us to look down the first base line. This would be the line that I would define as monotheism. There is one God, that's a vital part of our faith and a vital part of the understanding of the Trinity. So if you say that there is more than one God, then you are out of bounds on that side. There are many verses in the Bible that tell us there are one God. Deuteronomy 6.4 is a famous verse from the Old Testament. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. It is called the Shema and is quoted several times a day by pious Jews. The Jews made a unique contribution to the religions of the world. Many religions at the time, all of them, believed in more than one God, polytheism. The Jews gave us the gift of monotheism. Jesus affirmed that in the Gospel of Mark. Someone asked him, what is the greatest commandment? He replied, hear, O Israel. The Lord our God, the Lord, is one. One of the Ten Commandments said, You shall have no other gods before me. 1 Corinthians 8, 4 says, There is no God but one. The Bible affirms, and this side of the Trinity, this side of the ballpark, is not one that creates too much problems for us. Although Christians are often accused of being polytheistic because we talk about Jesus and the Holy Spirit and God the Father in such separate terms 
it's easy for us to forget that we're still talking about one God. We sometimes fudge that line by the way we describe Jesus and the Holy Spirit and the Father as separate. But classic Christian doctrine has always affirmed the oneness of God. And as you wrestle with your understanding, we should try not to ever get over that foul line. There is one God. The Lord is our God. Our God is one. Now I want us to look down the third baseline and discover the other boundary. The Bible affirms that Jesus is God. That's a very vital part of the doctrine of the Trinity. But this is where it gets more difficult for most people. According to classic Christian theology, to say that Jesus is not God is out of bounds for the doctrine of the Trinity. I suspect that most people who don't believe the Trinity go over this foul, foul line rather than the other. They believe Jesus was just a man. They will say gladly that he was a prophet, a model for our behavior, a great example, a spiritual man, a great teacher, but they will say, but I don't think he was God. They may even say he was somehow God's son, like the kings of Israel were called the sons of God, but they're not really ready to affirm that Jesus was God. It is at times a difficult uh, thing for us to understand. But one of the interesting aspects of this to me is that all the people in the first century had no trouble believing that Jesus was God. They had more trouble believing that he was human. And now we're just the opposite. All of the heresies that we read about in the earliest days were ones that said Jesus wasn't really physical. He was some kind of ghost-like person, and he was like a spirit because he was God. They were, those were the kinds of heresies that we read the most about. One of those was called docetism. But today the tables have turned. People have more trouble believing that Jesus was God than that they do believing he was a human. I want to suggest to you the scripture verses and the biblical reasons to say that Jesus was God. The writers of the New Testament struggled with who they thought Jesus was. And those who lived most closely with him kept getting this idea in their mind that he was so different from everybody they had ever met that he was God-like. And very soon, they were writing verses in the Bible. One of those, when Jesus was born, he was called Emmanuel, God with us. One of the most important verses is from the Gospel of John, the very first verse in John. In the beginning was the Word, the Logos, which is Jesus. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. In John 10, 30, Jesus said, The Father and I are one. In John 14, 9, he said, Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. One of the most important passages comes from Philippians chapter 2. It's the one where I got the children's confession of faith, Jesus Christ is Lord. Just before that, it talks about Jesus and says, Jesus was in the form of God, but did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness. Colossians 2.9 says, For in him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. It's a very powerful verse. Hebrews 1.3 says, He is the reflection of God's glory, the exact imprint of God's very being. So I want to suggest to you, you certainly can believe as many people do, that Jesus was merely a man. A lot of people believe that. But I want to suggest that you have trouble with these kinds of verses in the Bible. And personally, I don't know what else to do with them, but to accept that certainly that's what the Bible teaches, was that Jesus was somehow God and man. 
It's odd that we don't have a similar problem with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, I think, is easier for us to think is God. It is God's Spirit. It's mysterious. It's not a body. And so it's much easier. Jesus mentioned the Holy Spirit in our text for today from John 16. When the Spirit of truth comes, He will guide you into all truth. The early Christians could not help but talk about God, and in the same breath, they were talking about the Holy Spirit that comes, God's presence in us is that Spirit. And so we have God the Father and Jesus and the Holy Spirit are all lumped together. There are several verses that mention them all together. 2 Corinthians 13, 13, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you. And Matthew 28, the verse I read for the children's baptism. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So I I have to confess, I have trouble defining what that means between the foul lines. Somehow, God the Father is God. Somehow, the Holy Spirit is God. Somehow, Jesus is God. And somehow... We believe in monotheism. It's still one God, three in one, we often say. I, I have trouble with that, but I can, I can define those foul lines. That seems to help me understand Christian theology. But we must be careful. A lot of people use human analogies, and I, I won't even share any of those with you today. Perhaps you've heard many. Many of those analogies border on one foul line or the other. And I, I don't think they adequately grasp what's in between. I like this approach of saying, let's don't cross that foul line, let's don't cross that one. Some people say, if I can't understand it, I'm just not going to believe it. And I'm afraid I'm with Luther on this one. If you've got to understand it, you may go totally insane. It's just too hard to understand I want to give you a quote from a theologian I heard a few years ago, Justo Gonzalez. He said, The Trinity is a mystery, not a puzzle. You try to solve a puzzle. You stand in awe before a mystery. I want to show you a combined picture of two images here. Do you know what the image on the left is? Of course you do. It's a crossword puzzle. Everybody loves a puzzle, though I have to tell you I am not very good at crossword puzzles. But I know what you do with the puzzle. You try to solve it. Or in my case, you just attempt to. You don't ever really solve one of those things. My wife can, but I can't. Do you know what the image on the right of this picture is? Probably not. It's called the Penrose Triangle or the Impossible Triangle. It was first created by a Swedish artist Oscar Rutersvard in 1934. You can follow your eye along one of those legs and soon you're back to the same place you were and your mind just goes, what? This is impossible to understand. Many people have used this symbol for the Trinity, a modern symbol, and I, I really like it because it tells you that there are three legs on a triangle, but there's something really weird about it, something mysterious that is almost impossible to understand. That's why I like this. The Trinity is a mystery, much like this drawing. But I believe the mystery can't adequately be solved by human minds. If you feel you have to understand it completely, I'm afraid you'll never believe it. It's best to think of what is out of bounds and try to stay in the ballpark in fair ground territory there. Think again about that quote from Justo Gonzalez. The Trinity is a mystery, not a puzzle. You try to solve a puzzle. You stand in awe before a mystery. Let us pray. <clears throat> oh God, we come before you as people who want to take the Bible very seriously. And we love what the Jewish friends gave to us, the story of monotheism, that we have one God, not like all of those multiple gods of the Greeks and the Romans who were 
uh, sometimes not very godlike. And then we respect the witness of the writers of the New Testament, those people who were closest to Jesus that said there was something extraordinarily divine about him. Lord, we are wanting